Okay, good morning. I'm Dr. Judge Nell Jeffries, Professor of African American and African Studies at The Ohio State um, University. Um, I connected with Mr. John Curris on the subject of Mr. Uh, Demetrius DuBose about a year ago. Mr. Curris stumbled upon one of my first publications actually as a professor, a book chapter about the tragic uh, murder of Demetrius DuBose, published in, at that time, one of the most widely used texts in African American studies titled A Turbulent Voyage by Floyd W. Hayes uh, III. So as I was talking about off camera, I remember the exact day, I remember the exact time, I remember exactly what I was doing when I heard the news that Demetrius had been killed in San Diego. Now, if you remember, 1999 was like chock full of tragic events. In February, you had the murder of Amadou Diallo in, in New York, the Bronx specifically. And then in the sense Demetrius was killed. So Demetrius was killed on the 24th of July, if I remember correctly. Right. Just eight, just eight days earlier, just eight days earlier or so, you had the um, tragic death of John F. Kennedy Jr. and um, his wife, lovely wife, Jacqueline and Bassett uh, Kennedy. So um, that that month um, was rather traumatic for a whole bunch of people. But I remember the day I was walking through the um, student union. Um, I was headed to uh, the bus stop to go home. I lived a short um, few miles away from campus. And I stopped to pick up a campus newspaper. And next to the campus newspaper was the USA Today. And there it was, Demetrius DuBose shot and killed in San Diego. I, I, was, in, I was in disbelief. And the reason I was in disbelief is because I had followed that young man at the University uh, of Notre Dame, right? So um, he was co-captain of the University of Notre Dame football team, uh, of which you were a member, uh, Mr. Cross, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. right? He was a, um, a very good student, having earned two undergraduate um, degrees, right? And while some may disagree with me, when when the combine came around, I was fully expecting him to go um, on the first round of the NFL draft. He Are you anything else? He didn't. He slipped to the second round, right, was picked by Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But even now, I'll stick to my guns by saying that um, at least one or two of the linebackers who were selected ahead of him in the first round, right, we're not of his. We're not of his. We're not of his caliber. So Demetrius, yeah. Demetrius was considered sort of like an undersized linebacker at six one, like two hundred and thirty five pounds or something, right? But he was a hard hitter. He had a high IQ and he was um, um, quick, very athletic. So I was a little disappointed when he slipped to the second round. So when I saw this article, I was like, "What the hell? How could this happen?" Right? Yeah. Right. A gentleman, a young man of this stature, 28 years old, had just turned 28 years old a few months before, I believe, in uh, March. What's interesting about that is that when he was at the University of Notre Dame, he filled out a survey, a questionnaire that asked, um, you know, what would you like to be doing like at age 25 or something? And he said, hey, listen, I just want to be alive. Yeah. Right. Now, now the reason the reason why that's poignant is because here you had a young man who recognized the pearls of being a young African American male um, in the United States of America and how your life can be um, snuffed out at a moment's notice. Now, never in my wildest dreams did I think such a thing um, could happen to him. Right. Well, it's interesting. It's interesting you say that because 
And I'm not sure how familiar you are with some of the things that happened in college, but we can talk a little bit about uh, an incident that happened his junior season, uh, right before opening se the season started. Okay. Uh, he was at an off-campus party with about 500 students. Now Notre Dame uh, in 1991 was even less black than it, than it is now. Mm -hmm. So I would say the like African-American student population was 5%. A lot of, uh, and then I talked a lot of my friends who happen to be non-athletes in African American in Notre Dame. Everyone just assumed, hey, what sport do you play? <laughs> and it's because like I'm an accounting major. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but so Demetrius, you know, he he was like the unofficial mayor of campus. I mean, he went across all lines, socioeconomic lines, racial lines. He was friends with a ton of people. He was at a party. He was having a good time, just like everyone else was that was 21. He had probably had a little too much to drink, but literally 500 people at this party and the officers picked him out and said, you're under arrest out of mm -hmm. all of the. Now, our starting quarterback. Stood up for him and they arrested him, too, and he wasn't intoxicated, actually, but he stood up for him. So they arrested him, too, and. I know just from speaking with other teammates and friends and Demo's family that that incident did leave a mark on him, that he was like, OK, so now I see how it is. Like the one of the 10 black people at this party, I'm the one going in and targeted right away. Now, he had some other incidents, but you fast forward to July 24th, 1999. I'm just curious. You know, when, when certain things happen in life, you know, muscle memory, visceral feelings, I, I'm just curious if Demo was feeling that way and had just had enough. Like, I'm not, like, going to be keep being singled out. I mean, his friend Lavelle Carter, another African-American pro beach volleyball player, there weren't too many of those, but Lavelle said, hey, there was this one incident that I found out after Demo's death. He was parking his, his Land Rover and approaching my place and the police just pulled him over, just pulled him over and they sweated him for like an hour asking him a bunch of questions. And this is a guy that came over to his house all the time. Lavelle's neighbor was a sheriff, San Diego Ooh. County Sheriff. So he ended up going up to these two officers and said, are you guys gonna charge him with something? What is going on? Because it's ridiculous. I see him every day here. But Demo never even mentioned that to Lavelle. He went in and it was just like another night. But after he was murdered, the, the sheriff told him, this is what happened. This is the stuff that he had to endure. So I just want to touch a little bit about that. And, and as the second round pick story goes, uh, the reason he ended up in the second round was because of a false hairline fracture on his left shin that showed mm. up in an, on an x-ray before mm -hmm. the... So just to give you a little insight on that. Oh, didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so listen, Mr. Cross, this is what you mentioned. So it is possible that he had had enough, that he was fed up with being racially profiled, targeted. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm here to tell your viewers that that's a sentiment that probably 99% of um, African descended people in the United States of America feel namely, namely um, black men, right? Now, it, it, the, the officers did what officers typically do, and that is um, say that they feared for their lives. It is possible that Demetrius grew angry as anyone would, right? And his mannerisms expressed a certain level of frustration Yet still, you have two police officers um, on the scene, right? There are people trying to scream at the officers to um, inform him as to who this guy is, right? Former Tampa Bay Buccaneer, former New York Jet, although his stay with the Jets was very brief, right? There are some folk who try to paint Demetrius as a down and out NFL. -er. That wasn't the case. I understand that he was going to pursue a career in um, beach volleyball, but if, but if he had decided to pursue um, his NFL career, I am confident that he would have eventually latched on to a team either during training camp 
or as the fall season emerged. So I want to I want to I want to disabuse people of any notion that this was a down and out football player. I will say this. So when I heard the news, I immediately started putting my thoughts down on paper. And interestingly, Mr. Gore, interestingly, right? Demetrius DuBose's death, his murder, is what started me to write and publish on the issue of police use of excessive force against wow. motorists and pedestrians. He was the subject of my very first referee journal article on police use of excessive force against wow. black people. And I've been writing on the subject um, ever since. I'm also convinced that one of the reasons why um, uh, the officers were not held accountable is because his murder didn't get the attention that it deserved, right? Because right. the news was saturated with the death of John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carl Lyne Bissett Kennedy. But had his had his murder had his murder got the attention that even Amadou Diallo's murder got, I'm thinking it may have been a different um, outcome. Because at the end of the day, how do you explain a young man of this stature? Right? We're not talking about no disrespect to him, but we're not talking about Rodney King, right? With the check it pass, right? We're talking about a guy who went to the University of Notre Dame, starred in the classroom and on the field. And yep. he ends up being shot a dozen times, several of which were in the back. Well, six in the back. And actually, after looking at the autopsy pics and studying everything, it was 13. He got hit 13 times. The media just took the- 13 pick. times. Because there was, a, there was one, like a defensive wound that grazed his wrist. And they also want to say this, these pictures that I had to see of our of our leader and our captain you know they hit him so hard with nunchucks that it split his wrist open you could see it down through the bone so i mean he and and i also want to clarify one thing the witnesses that i've talked to that are not law enforcement or not affiliated with the military and again i've read your articles and we come from the same background dr jeffries i come from a, fa a military family my grandfather was a beat cop in Hammond, Indiana, in a rough neighborhood. But I see what I see, and I'm going to call it like I see it, no matter what the circumstance. So this, this particular, and, and I know what's going on in the greater context of things as well, right? Mm -hmm. This situation with Demetrius, even though he is frustrated, he never did anything except to say, the situation has been resolved. I'm not going to let you just put handcuffs on me. The yeah. neighbor, you know, he's like, it's been resolved. What is the issue here? Well, the issue is this. Here's, here's what it is. It's the prison industrial complex. They see a black man, even though the situation has been resolved, even though the one neighbor, the, the, first, the cop, Robert Wills, who shoots the first bullet into Demetrius's back, says it's so weird because I'm looking at the reporting party and the suspect. And they're talking cordially, yet he still feels the need to step to the black man. Mm. Okay. And what does he say? Well, after the fact, he says he seems like he was high on PCP. Mm -hmm. They start throwing PCP out there. Now, Demetrius never did PCP. I'll speak very openly about what he did do. And he struggled with the precipitous drop of not playing in the NFL anymore. So he did do self, he self-medicated. He experimented with ketamine, which right now is a, is a legal substance administered to veterans who have PTSD and other people that suffer from trauma. You know, he, he did experiment with ecstasy, which I did too in the nineties. And I don't know anyone else in their twenties who going through some, I mean, a lot of people did. This is just what the culture was. This is what was out there at the clubs and at parties. So he had, he had these issues a little bit, right? But he had, by the end of his life, he had kind of broken through that. Like the last few months of his life, he had turned the corner. He had endured some real personal heartbreak that I won't go into out of respect for his privacy and his family's privacy. But he endured some real tragedy 
I mean, stuff that would shut down other people. But for Demo, that tragedy towards the end of his life was what he needed to kind of start waking himself up out of this, you know, dark period that he was in. Mm -hmm. So the last day of his life, witnesses say he played the best volleyball of his life. Like he went the longest in a tournament that he ever did on that last day of his life. His roommate, Randy West, who had a pro beach volleyball league, Demetrius came in, he got a sponsorship with Captain Morgan's for them. He started getting business. He was not out of the woods as far as like, you know, some of some of his issues. And I think I am not an, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not going to pretend to diagnose him, but I can say at the very least, he, he had some depression over not playing anymore. And he was, and then out of this horrible heartbreak that he had to endure, but he was coming out of it and he was fighting. He, he deserved a chance to turn his life around and he was starting to do that. But when they swoop in and they see him and they ask, and then he starts being honest, tells them, yeah, I've been arrested. What were you arrested for? Uh, possession of a controlled substance. They're like, that's when they said, stand up, put your arms behind your back. He's like, whoa, I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything. Then they pepper spray him. That's when he jumps. He's sitting on the steps, jumps over the steps and runs down the alley. Now what you hear happens is the story is officer keating jumped on his back and demetrius flew him into a flower bed randy west who was right there on the steps and charles flynn they that's not the account they give randy west said keating's running after him wills is right behind him but keating fell down and that's what happened he just fell down running after him his flashlight went falling wills and demo turned the quarter keating's like 50 feet behind Will starts hitting him with nunchucks. Demetrius is like trying to get the nunchucks off him. Keating comes, starts hitting him with nunchucks. They're both on his back. He just takes the nunchucks out of their hands. Like according to Rita Yonker, a civilian witness, like candy from a baby, he took them. And she said, they seemed like the officers were pissed off that he took away their toys. Hmm. And took away their toys, he did like a little sack dance. He really did. And he put them on the ground. First shot goes right into his back. And the rest is what we know happened. And so they were able to take his past struggles and reconstruct the narrative of what happened on that day. He was high on PCP. This dude played volleyball all day. Mm -hmm. You know, he had had two beers after the volleyball game. They, they took a substance, a small amount. You know, he had done ecstasy a few days before. They took that and said, well, look, on drugs, we thought he was high on PCP, and they used that as shade, and it stayed shade for years. Oh yeah. Look what happened with George Floyd, right? Immediately after, they're still trying to say, well, shoot, he had drugs in his system, that's what killed him, and that's not, you know, but we're seeing what killed him. Yeah. We're seeing his inability to breathe. He's begging for it. And Demetrius was screaming the death cry when this happened. I mean, screaming, ah! like, no, like knowing it was going to happen. But you have other people, our teammates who think, was this suicide by cop? Absolutely not. It wasn't. Mm. It was nowhere near that. You know, I think Demo is, uh, is was such an evolved human being here on Earth. And I feel his spirit all the time, all around me. And I think he would want us to almost like these dudes overreacted, you know, I, I think he wants us to raise our collective consciousness around this issue and to use his story to give people pause and say, let's stop this now. Let's figure out what to do and where to go. So I really want to connect with you on an academic level and be, meet with your class. And I want us to talk about Demetrius and how it fits into today's world. And that's what we need to do with this. This is much more than a documentary. And we have a traditional documentary, but what we're doing here, this is something that needs to be taught to people, to classes, to grade school, high school, college. And we need to stop. You know, Mr. Kors, listening to you, I think you've just inspired me to put more words on paper regarding uh, Demetrius. I only wrote, only wrote one, maybe two, no more than two pieces on him. I may have to. I may have to revisit him in my academic um, 
um, writings because when you when you when you when you look at this case, you say, okay, so typically what law enforcement does is they look into a person's background and they identify something in the person's background that they can use to um, character assassinate, right? Yep. So as to frame this narrative in such a way where the person becomes the villain and uh, the perpetrator actually becomes um, the, 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 the innocent, right? Yes. And what they found was they found, okay, some drug use, right? But that's basically all they found. But they used that, and I'm gonna say this, Ms. Girl, sometimes, sometimes the media is complicit in this characterization of the the victim and 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 not by accident right i mean the articles in the tribune that i read about my friend were like well this guy has a problem he has a problem a violent past with law enforcement like why is he that and i know because i hear some of these people on sports radio now that wrote these articles i think they need to go back and reread what they wrote. David Haw from the Chicago Tribune in particular needs to go reread what he wrote and talk about it. Because I know now, I, I firmly believe he would have a different perspective. And I'm not trying to call him out. I think he is a, you know, someone who tries to fight the good fight, has tries to do the right thing. And hopefully his perspective has evolved because of all of the things that have happened between 1999 and 2021. We we'll also have to, we cannot forget Emmett Till. We cannot forget the people that came before 1999 because this is all the same, these are all the same stories. Yeah, it's a continuation. Yeah, it's a continuation. Now, 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 Ms. Cross, listen, when you talk about this specific reporter and, and, and you say, hey, listen, um, upon reflection, I would like to think that he would view that situation um, differently. Um, I'm not so sure. <laughs> because hey, listen. Because hey, listen. If if you can't look at Demetrius and say he doesn't fit, he doesn't fit the narrative that folk normally associate with people who are the victims of police use of the sex of force. Well, he doesn't I, fit that. He doesn't fit that characterization. If that no. doesn't, if that doesn't, if that doesn't cause you to stop, pump yeah. the brakes and say, wait a minute. Something's well, we, not right here. You have to understand too, though, this, that some of our former teammates and his former teammates had heard of some of his struggles, had heard the scuttle, but they've, they'd seen it. They'd seen it firsthand with him, with Dima, right? And then they have what ends up happening too in cases like this, law, law enforcement will have people, civilians, like for in this case, there was a gentleman who ended up claiming to have been really good friends with Demetrius, a workout partner, and he testified on behalf of law enforcement against Demetrius, said he found a, a bag the size of a pool ball with cocaine in it laying on his floor, and that it was Demetrius's, and he had to tell him to leave. He says that a month before Demetrius's murder, he saw him looking homeless and way underweight, chain-smoking cigarettes, and almost looking like he was begging for money. So somehow in a month, he transformed from looking homeless and 40 pounds underweight and smoking cigarettes to a guy who was like cut out of a, of a mountain, like Dionysus. You know, according to Randy West and to other pro beach volleyball guys, this dude was in great shape the day of his death. So how does this happen? Well, and then, then the people start questioning themselves. Like, yeah, man, he was really messed up. He, you know, it's a, it was a drug thing. It was not, it's not a cop thing. It's not a, it's not a systemic racist thing. You know, they, they kind of, and they're still swallowing it. There are people that are still swallowing this big time people no doubt. who, no doubt. No doubt. you know, people that claim to have been his best friends. I would not be surprised, Mr. Chorus, and I'm not into conspiracy theories, although if I, although if I believe it, it's not theoretical. I would not be surprised if there were members of certain media outlets working in tandem with law enforcement to create a narrative about Demetrius 
such that you prevent the reading public from demonstrating sympathy and empathy for this young man. And in the process, villainizing him so that when a trial emerges, you get a jury, right? That's pro law enforcement and anti the victim of police use of excessive force. It would not surprise me if those elements were at work, especially since the DA came out and said, the, these were his exact words, the police had no choice, they had to shoot. Listen to this. You know, the only thing that was ever done until your article, until this project, HBO Real Sports is like a five minute piece, right? Mm -hmm. on, on this. It was, a, it was like a month after it happened. So I contacted, uh, I'm not gonna say who, but someone from HBO Real Sports and said, I'd like to interview about you about this. And, he's, and he texted me back and said, it was a cover up. And then he, the, next, the next thing he said, I can't do it. I, I gotta feed my family. Mm. So mm. yeah, I mean, look, I, I talked to an FBI agent who was in San Diego at the time because it seemed to me like what about the possibility of them planting drugs into his system after post-mortem? Like, how does that, does that happen ever? And he threw that out there, no way. And I let it go. But now I've talked to a couple of other people like, are you serious? You don't think that could happen? And people that have been deeply involved in things like this. Mm. So I'm open-minded and brokenhearted at the same time. And my heart is filled with some days with compassion and love and kindness. And other days like today, it's filled with furious rage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. want to be still with it because I don't I want this to stop like I said and I don't want to react from even though emotion is important I want to I want us to be sensible about this and figure out what to do with it so I we need to wrap this up but I want you to you know this is your chance to say whatever if you could say something to Demetrius I'd like you to say something to him right now through me and then at the and then say whatever else you want Hey, listen, Mr. Cross, let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something. This project that you're doing, let me explain to you just in case you haven't contextualized it in this way. What you are doing in honor of Demetrius is what is, is tantamount to what Jet Magazine did for Emmett Till. When Jet Magazine, when other media would not show um, Emmett Till's disfigured, monstrous image, Jet put it front and center, reminding people, right? Keeping it fresh in people's minds. And as a result, Emmett Till goes down um, in history, taught in classrooms, the subject of research projects, documentaries, your documentary is going to do for Demetrius what Jet Magazine did for uh, Emmett Till. The publicity that Demetrius didn't get in 1999 because of the plane crash um, with um, John F. Kennedy Jr. and his wife, right, is going to um, come to fore in the coming months and years. That's going to be, that's going to be um, your signature piece. That's going to be your legacy, Mr. Ross. I predict that's going to be your legacy. Man, and from, from after your after your documentary airs, after your documentary airs, when we talk about the history of police brutality in this country, right? Demetrius Dubose's name will be featured promptly because right now I can walk into any I can walk into any class. Um, on any college and university campus and mention Demetrius Dubose, they won't know who in the heck I'm talking about. Right? Well, maybe by fall we can change that. Oh yeah, you're gonna change it. No doubt about it. And anything I can do to help. Anything hey, I can do to help. Much love to you, Dr. Jeffries. It's been an yeah. honor to have you go. Thank you, I've been honored. Thank you Thank very you. much. We'll be in touch. Much love. All right, so long. Bye.